I'm excited to have you here. We are here for the Living with Lions webinar series. I'd like to welcome you. This webinar series is offered thanks to the generous support of our members and supporters in all 50 states and beyond. I'm Brent Lyles, Executive Director of the Mountain Lion Foundation. And as you probably know, if you're tuning into this, the Mountain Lion Foundation is a national not-for-profit organization that's dedicated to ensuring that Americans' lion survives and flourishes in the wild. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the fact that mountain lions and other wild cats are among the planet's most road impacted species. And we'll talk about what the growing interest in wildlife crossings could mean for mountain lion conservation. Our guest today is environmental journalist, Ben Goldfarb. And if you like to read about important environmental issues, you've almost certainly read articles written by Ben because his work has appeared in National Geographic, The Atlantic, New York Times, Scientific American, Washington Post, Orion Magazine, the Guardian, High Country News, Outside Magazine. I could go on and on. Uh, his work has appeared all over the place. He's also the author of the book, Eager, the Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter, winner of the 2019 Penn E.O. Wilson Literary, Literary Science Writing Award. We'll be talking with Ben about his newest book just released last week. It's called Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. I just finished reading it last night, and for those of you who are turning, tuning in, I just need to tell you that this is a great book. I really enjoyed it. Um, even as someone who knows about wildlife and knows about wildlife crossings to some extent, this book really opened my eyes to this whole diverse and exciting and interesting, fascinating world of road ecology. Um, I really can't recommend it highly enough. It was a lot of fun, um, and Ben's a great writer. So uh, go ahead and get a copy of that. Um, Speaking of copies of, of the book, before we dive into our talk, we have a book winner to announce. We've actually randomly selected Emily Thomas to receive a copy of the book. Congratulations, Emily. We will have another drawing during the Q&A just for those of you who are here listening in today. So stay tuned for that. As questions come up for you, please type those in to the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window. And we'll be going through those after Ben presents. So Ben, hello and welcome. Hi, thanks so much for that introduction, Brent, and, and uh, thanks to you all for having me and for being here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Well, great, Ben, I'll turn it over to you. You've got a presentation for us. And then once you're done with that, we'll, we'll have a little more conversation and, and go to some of our Q&A as well. Okay, fantastic. Um, so again, thank you all for, for, for being here uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm here to talk about this new book, Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. And, uh, you know, Brent talked a little bit about road ecology, you know, this new or new-ish scientific discipline that looks at how roads and really all of our transportation infrastructure uh, shapes and transforms our, our natural world. And, you know, roads are so transformative in part because they're so ubiquitous. Roads are everywhere, right? We drive them constantly. Uh, and there are 4 million miles of road in the, in the United States alone. There are 40 million miles of road worldwide. Uh, and there are 15 million miles more coming by the, the middle of this century. That's how many more road miles or paved road miles uh, will, will be built by, uh, by 2050. So these structures are so ubiquitous that I think they're somewhat invisible to us. We don't uh, think about them all that often because we just use them constantly. Uh, and when we do think about them, you know, we tend to think about them uh, as symbols of human mobility and movement and freedom, you know, that's in our collective national consciousness, thanks to Jack Kerouac and Bruce Springsteen and all of the, the bards of the open road. Uh, when in reality, roads do exactly the opposite to wild animals, right? They're facilitators of human mobility and connection, and they're ecological catastrophes that curtail animal movement uh, at truly massive scales. And one of the things that road ecology, this field of, of science attempts to do is, is just figure out exactly how roads transform our, our natural world. And, you know, roads are, again, so transformative that it's hard to fully wrap our minds around all of the things that they do, but certainly one of the most prominent is that they kill a lot of animals, right? Roadkill is sort of the most conspicuous manifestation of how roads and wildlife uh, interact. More than a million animals uh, are killed on American roads every day. 
uh, and you know, roads are certainly uh, an existential threat to uh, to many threatened and endangered species like the Florida panther and the tiger salamander and the Houston toad. I try to avoid having too many roadkill pictures in my my presentations, but this is a a bobcat uh, in Texas that uh, I, I came upon that met its met its end down a road. And certainly, cats are among the most frequent, or at least among the most uh, road imperiled organisms uh, out there. And we'll talk a, a lot more about that in a second. So although, you know, roadkill is the most, again, conspicuous manifestation of this problem, roads cause all kinds of different ecological crises. You know, they're vectors of, in of invasive species, uh, you know, non-native plants and animals follow these linear corridors into landscapes and proliferate. This is uh, this swath of invasive musk thistle that I came across in Montana uh, that was basically seeded by truck tires, seeds being transported in truck tire tires and sprouting uh, on this, this old logging road. Roads are sources of pollution, right? Our cars are spewing cadmium and copper and zinc uh, into the into the uh, the environment constantly. Uh, you know, there's a chemical and tire particles that is uh, causing coho salmon die-offs in the Puget Sound watershed at a, a massive scale. So, you know, roads are these again these vectors of chemical pollution as well. There are also these strips of salt. You know, we apply 20 million tons of, of de-icing salt to our, our highways every year. And all of that road salt runs off into rivers and lakes and, uh, you know, turns fresh water into estuaries, essentially. Uh, and, you know, road, road salt is also an ecological trap that lures animals to the highway. You know, road, is, road salt is this, or salt is this stimulant uh, that animals crave. And, and uh, you know, by turning our roads into these long linear salty potato chips, you know, we're drawing lots of critters to the highway. And that's of course a, a dangerous place for animals to be. Uh, that briefly, that kind of ecological trap phenomenon inspired my, my favorite road sign. I'm not a big fan of road signs in general. I don't do a whole lot. Um, but I do love this uh, this series of signs in uh, in Jasper National Park in Canada, uh, where they put up signs every winter saying, "Do not let moose lick your car." Uh, that's just how salty we've created. Uh, we've we've turned our our, our roads. Um, I don't think you could stop a moose from licking your car. I think if a moose wants to lick your car, the moose is going to lick your car. But you know, you could at least try. Uh, roads are also kind of these hellscapes of noise, right? All of the the noise pollution from engines and tires bleeding into the uh, the the environment uh, is essentially a form of habitat loss. You know, whether you're a, a prey species or a predator, you know, you, you need to listen uh, for the the subtle acoustic signals of other organisms. And if you can't hear your predators or prey uh, because of road noise pollution, you know, you function you functionally can't live in that place, right? So noise pollution is really a, a profound form of habitat loss. But it's not entirely doom and gloom. You know, roads are also creators of novel ecosystems. You know, roads have been on the landscape for thousands of years and animals have learned to exploit them in all kinds of ingenious ways. This is a, a colony of uh, little brown bats that uh, I was shown nesting or roosting rather in, in the, the kind of the crevices in a, a highway uh, overpass. So, you know, animals learn to take advantage of these these structures as well, right? Roads are sources of carrion. Uh, they're, they're, you know, good spots to hang out for golden eagles and bald eagles and ravens and magpies, this whole community of scavengers that's learned to take advantage of roadkill, um, but of course also risks becoming roadkill themselves. You know, the road can again become an ecological trap by luring animals in with the promise of, uh, of, of food and, and, then, uh, and then killing them. Oops. And then, you know, the kind of the, the one of the, the most profound things that roads do that I think is most relevant for, for um, you know, the mountain lion component of, of this is that roads disrupt animal movement, right? Of course, yes, they kill animals directly, but even more than that, that constant uh, barrier of traffic, right? That steady stream of cars cruising uh, through the through the landscape creates what researchers have called a, a moving fence. This impediment to animal movement. So, you know, you you know, you often see low roadkill rates on big interstate highways because animals never attempt to cross the road at all, uh, and that can be more severe even in some ways than the the than roadkill itself. You know, here's a, a great illustrative 
map of, of, uh, of mule deer locations in Wyoming. And, you know, basically all of these purple blotches are where mule deer hang out. Um, this is their winter range, you know, these kind of low elevation valleys uh, where they need to, you know, they need to find food in winter. Um, you know, the places that are generally snow free. And you can see uh, here's Interstate 80 just cutting through the landscape. And there are basically no mule deer locations south of that interstate, right? So in some years when the snow is really deep, mass starvation will occur in this mule deer herd because animals can't keep pressing south to that low elevation habitat that they're trying to access, right? So in some ways, again, that's worse than roadkill. You know, a, a herd of mule deer can take, uh, you know, a, a handful of vehicle collisions, you know, they can survive that. What they can't survive is losing access to all of that habitat. And that, again, I think is a, a really important point, right? The road itself might only be 150 feet wide, and yet it's inflicting habitat loss uh, on a, a really massive scale and denying animals access to the, the resources they need. Here's just one more illustration of that same point. This is a, a map of grizzly bear locations. This is one grizzly bear uh, in Montana. And uh, you can just see all of these little red X's are places where he tried to cross I-90 and he just keeps bouncing off like a ping pong ball repelled by that moving fence of traffic. And it took him more than two years and 40 attempts or 40 something attempts to successfully cross I-90, which he, he finally did in, uh, in, in 2021. But you can just see all of these crossing attempts that are frustrated uh, by that steady stream of traffic. And I think that that brings us to mountain lions, which, you know, in, in many ways are one of the poster species for the, the harms that roads can cause, uh, in large part because they're such wide ranging animals, right? As, as I'm sure all of you mountain lion fans know, they, they cover huge territories and those movements across huge territories inevitably lead them across roads, right? Our, our road infrastructure is so dense that it's basically impossible, uh, you know, to occupy 200 square miles if you're a male mountain lion without crossing roads frequently. And that often leads them into uh, danger. You know, the, the kind of the emblematic um, case study for, for the harms of roads, of course, is the Florida panther, as, as many of you know. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a, a subspecies that's existentially threatened by by vehicle collisions. You know, today there are around 200 Florida Panthers uh, in the Southeast. And uh, last year there were 27 road mortalities. So more than 10% of the population uh, was killed by vehicles, which is of course an, a massive number, um, you know, and again, truly a, an, an existential threat. And that's again, because we have this, you know, incredibly dense network of roads uh, in the Southeast that these cats have to inevitably cross uh, as they make their way through the landscape. And just briefly, incidentally, you know, I've got this picture of the Florida Panther crossing, but in fact, you know, these, these road crossing signs, you know, all of those yellow diamonds that you see out on the landscape, there's plenty of research showing that those are not effective at all. Uh, you know, drivers habituate to them and ignore them. I've heard biologists call them litter on sticks, right? So, you know, you might, you see, the, you see these signs all over the place and they don't actually uh, do, do a whole lot. But again, it's, you know, it's not just the, the roadkill itself that's so detrimental to mountain lions. It's also that that barrier effect we were discussing earlier, right? The fact that, you know, that these transportation corridors are preventing animals from moving across the landscape at uh, a really enormous scale. I was just, um, I was just out on the Olympic Peninsula a few days ago in, in Washington uh, with the Olympic Cougar Project, this coalition of researchers who are looking at, uh, at mountain lion movements uh, on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, and what they've found uh, is that the peninsula is functionally an island uh, because of I-5, right, the, you know, the huge corridor uh, of, of, you know, the interstate and all of the surrounding infrastructure that connects, you know, Bellingham to Seattle to Tacoma to Olympia um, and functionally prevents cougars on the peninsula from interacting with cougars in mainland Washington. You know, in six years and more than 100 collared cats, they've only seen one mountain lion. Uh, successfully cross I-5. So, you know, our our, uh, our road infrastructure is essentially creating island ecosystems in terrestrial habitats. And, you know, the place where that phenomenon is most acute is a, a place that I'm, I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with, are familiar with, which is the Santa Monica Mountains, right? This is probably the most famous uh, population of mountain lions in the, in the United States. 
um, you know, they're trapped in this little wedge of habitat surrounded by, by freeways uh, that has functionally insularized them, right? Turned the Santa Monica's into an island. And here's just a, you know, a great, you know, this is kind of a busy uh, graphic, but you know, what's going on here is that each color is essentially a, a you know, a cluster of locations from different mountain lines that have been uh, GPS collared by the National Park Service. And, you know, what you can see here very clearly, I think, is that, you know, these, all of these big Southern California freeways are complete barriers to mountain lion movement, right? Here's the, here's the 101, here's the 405, uh, and you basically never see any lions successfully crossing those those interstates, right? Uh, you know, you can see that all of the purple dots are here and the yellow dots are here and the red dots are here and there's basically no movement uh, across those across those 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 busy uh, uh, US freeways. Um, so again, you know, the Santa Monica's have essentially become an, an island thanks to our 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 road network. Uh, and, you know, that is coming, that is leading to severe consequences. You know, I'm sure, again, many of you probably know this story because, because it's become such a, a, a famous one, but right, these are all of the, the P's, you know, the famous, you know, P1 and P12 and P22 and P65, you know, all of these kind of iconic cats that have been collared by the National Park Service over the last, you know, 20 something years. And, you know, what they've, what they've found very clearly is that, you know, young mountain lions, Young, those young male dispersers can't escape this population because of all of these big, busy freeways. So the young male, dis the, the would-be dispersers, you know, often end up in conflicts with their with other uh, large males, including their own fathers, and you know, get killed by them. Um, but you know, even more problematically, in some ways, of course, is that new mountain lions can't enter the population, right? Because of because of the 101 primarily. Uh, and as a result, you know, individual male mountain lions have ended up mating with their daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters. Uh, and so the population is kind of chronically inbred um, and has begun to suffer uh, genetic defects as a result. This is uh, P81, um, a mountain lion who was captured a, a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, although he's sort of outwardly healthy, uh, he had a he had a, a kinked tail and uh, an undescended testicle, um, which are signs of, of uh inbreeding genetic defects that you know, have also cropped up in the, the Florida panther over the years. And, you know, those those kind of ominous signs of genetic abnormalities, um, you know, are, are, are part of what has led researchers to conclude uh, that this population of mountain lions is, is now in what's known as an extinction vortex, you know, this inevitable uh, long term spiral that, uh, you know, unlift, if left unaddressed, will lead to their uh, their their disappearance uh, over over time. So uh, given all of these, you know, these these harms of roads, you know, both the, the, the wildlife vehicle collision issue uh, and the this barrier effect that can lead to genetic fragmentation and inbreeding in, uh, in, in mountain lions, you know, what do we do about it? What are our what are our solutions? And, you know, really the best technology at our disposal uh, are wildlife crossings, you know, these overpasses and underpasses uh, that allow animals to cross roads safely. Um, and you can see here, you know, it's, I think the one component of this that often gets overlooked are the, the importance of roadside fences, right? People always ask, how do the animals find the structures? Well, you know, the answer is that fences prevent them from crossing the road and, you know, a mountain lion or an elk or a bear or whatever species, you know, hits that fence line, paces the fence line looking for a way across, and finally finds that that uh, that crossing structure. And you know these structures are incredibly effective. You know they they uh, they have really high passage rates. Um, you know when they're when they're well built. This is a kind of a very famous one in in Washington State on uh, I ninety. This is up on uh, Snoqualmie Pass. Um, these were built uh, in twenty eighteen. Um, and this this big overpass is part of this larger network of, of crossing structures. There are, you know, there are a number of these big open span underpasses. And these are actually the sorts of structures that mountain lions seem to prefer. There, you know, there are some species like pronghorn, for example, or grizzly bears that have a very strong preference for overpasses. Um, whereas mountain lions are, are very happy, uh, you know, using using underpasses and even, you know, in some cases, surprisingly small culverts. So mountain lions are very willing uh, users of wildlife crossings, which is which is great. Um, and these, you know, these these sorts of structures, you know, again, they're, they're very effective. Um, you know, they often pay for themselves by preventing dangerous, expensive collisions with elk and deer and moose and other other large critters. 
Um, and, uh, you know, again, they do get lots of lion use. I just wanted to briefly show a video from these from this network of wildlife crossings in on the I-90 in, in Washington state, because there's a little little cat cameo here. Um, and this is just a cool video that, that illustrates, I think, the diversity of species uh, that are willing to use this these sorts of structures um, and how uh, effective they can they can be. So we'll just let this pay, play for a second. It has this. Yeah. That's some fun jaunty music. There's the there's the there's the cat briefly there. I hope you saw that. <laughs> so plenty of elk, deer. All carnivores. I love these things. The family of river otters, kind of cool, even one of the, the stream associated crossings. Anyway, kind of neat. Um, so again, you know, these these crossings uh, are really effective um, and, you know, happily we're building more of them. And, and one of the places that they're being built, um, of course, is, you know, probably the most famous uh, wildlife overpass in the country, um, certainly the most famous in progress overpass in the country, which is at Liberty Canyon, right? This this site um, that's you know been identified by uh, you know various um, you know GPS collar analyses and and um, you know sort of this this corridor essentially uh, in the Santa Monica Mountains uh, where uh, the Simi Hills and the Santa Monica Mountains kind of converge um, at the 101. Uh, and this has been identified again, you know, over the course of many years of research as sort of the, the critical linkage that could reconnect that famous Santa Monica mountain lion population with the rest of, of California's mountain lions and potentially save them from this extinction vortex that we were we were talking about earlier. And this structure is uh, it's currently being built largely using private philanthropy. Uh, it's it's uh, it'll be completed in uh, in twenty twenty five and and um, you know it's it's a re really an amazing structure. Certainly the most uh, the largest and most ambitious wildlife crossing ever built in the, the United States. And you know one of the things that makes it so fascinating and ambitious and challenging, you know, is, is that it's not just creating a bridge over a, 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 a freeway. It's, you know, it's really creating a unique ecosystem out of, uh, you know, out of, out of new earth in a lot of ways. You know, when the, when the, the 101 kind of chopped through that, that canyon, uh, you know, it really took off, it kind of cut off the, the whole toes of the mountainside, essentially. So in addition to building an overpass itself, you know, the, the the uh, the architects and engineers are also sort of rebuilding the approach slopes, you know, the the kind of the, the entrance ramps that lead uh, onto the uh, the overpass. The whole thing is going to be about nine acres of essentially new new habitat. Now, all of it, you know, landscaped in uh, you know oak woodlands and chaparral and the whole native ecosystem essentially. And you can see that it's not only it has to not only cross you know, 10 lanes of traffic plus the two shoulders of the 101. It's also crossing this uh, Agora Road, this sort of separate residential road. So this is truly a, a massive project, um, which will, uh, you know, when all said and done, cost about $90 million, certainly the most expensive wildlife crossing uh, in the United States, but, uh, you know, certainly justified by the urgency of this, you know, pending risk of, uh, of, of extinction. And again, you know, I think the important thing to note is that this this crossing, although mountain lions are nominally the the species of concern here, you know, certainly the flagship species for this project, it's going to serve the entire ecosystem, right? From bobcats to bats to rabbits to lizards and toads, uh, and as a result, you know, the the landscape architects tasked with creating this this structure have to think about all of those different species. Of course, each one has its own little habitat requirements. And, you know, they're doing everything from installing, you know, log jams and rock piles for, for lizards to inoculating the soil with, you know, native mycorrhizal fungi to, you know, to create uh, suitable insect habitat. Um, so it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's not just building a bridge, it's truly creating a, a unique ecosystem that's going to cross this highway. Uh, and it's, it's kind of also a cool testament, I think, to how, you know, serving this single iconic species, the mountain lion, uh, can also benefit uh, all of the all of the members of the uh, of the ecosystem. 
And again, you know, the structure is uh, is under construction right now. Uh, it'll be uh, it'll be built by uh, by twenty twenty five or so. Um, and it's uh, you know a really exciting time in in uh, sort of the history of road ecology because this is going to be such a a high visibility project. It's certainly going to inspire uh, many, many more wildlife crossings. Uh, you know, I live in Colorado, um, and uh, you know, one of the places that 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 many road ecologists and conservationists in uh, Colorado have talked about forever uh, is a wildlife crossing over I seventy, um, which is you know sort of the 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 term for the 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 nickname for I seventy is the Berlin Wall for wildlife. You know, this absolute barrier to lynx movement mostly. Uh, you know, we have about two hundred lynx in Colorado, and they all live south of I seventy because I seventy is again, this, this, uh, this wall. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, the kind of the pots of money that's available now to build uh, structures on I-70 and, and many other places in the United States is this $350 million grant program that was included in the, the 2021 Infrastructure Act uh, that has inspired uh, many states, including Colorado and California and Utah and New Mexico, to set aside funding uh, for wildlife crossings you know that that state funding can be used to leverage more federal funding, and and now I seventy is one of the places that hopefully will be targeted by this new uh, infrastructure act uh, money that's that's available. So it's a really exciting time um, for wildlife crossings and for for road ecology. Uh, you know, in in large part because again there is all of this new state and federal funding that didn't exist a couple of years ago. It's not adequate to meet the national scale of need, right? Of course, there are so many ecosystems that highways have fragmented and so many roadkill hotspots that you know remain unaddressed um, but at least this you know this this starts the process of of, of of healing some of those ecological wounds and I should I should add that also plenty of mountain lions have been detected um, on both sides of, of i-70 but you know but don't really seem to cross um, so mountain lions will also be one of the species served by uh, by wildlife crossings uh, at East Vale Pass on on i-70. So again, you know, the, the task before us is, is really to, uh, in many ways, to remake our, our infrastructure, right? Where, you know, we've learned so much about uh, the harms that roads have inflicted upon uh, upon natural ecosystems. And, you know, if we're, if we're going to avert this sixth extinction, this mass extinction event that we're in, infrastructure is, is really one of the arenas that we need to focus on. You know, it's truly, again, an existential threat to so many species. Um, you know, one, one example is the, uh, the ocelot. You know, there are about 100 ocelots left in the United States, uh, all of them in, in South Texas, and road mortality is the, uh, the, the number one source of mortality for, for that ocelot population and is truly one of the factors that uh, you know could cause us to lose ocelots in our our, our lifetime and you know here's a, a wildlife crossing built for ocelots um, which is kind of cool you can see that it's you know it sort of follows this the course of this stream and there are a couple of shelves on either sides uh, that allow you know that allow cats to uh, walk through without without getting their feet wet so just to say that you know that that roadkill I think that in part because you know the animals we see dead on the highway most often tend to be relatively common creatures like deer and raccoons and squirrels you know we don't really think about roadkill as being again this true extinction level threat for some species uh, but there's there's no question that it is and and uh, cats are in many ways the, uh, the the poster organisms for for that that crisis. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll say again, you know, the, the, my new book, if, you, if, this just, if this just only whet your appetite for road ecology, my, my new book is called Crossings. It's gotten some um, some great reviews so far, I'm, I'm proud to say, from places like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. So, you know, both liberals and conservatives coming together to uh, to think about the value of, uh, of, of, uh, of wildlife crossings and the importance of road ecology. Um, and uh, with that, I'm happy to take some questions. I think there are probably some in the, in the chat and, uh, and um, I'm sure Brent would also uh, love to field some questions too. So thank you all so much and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Ben, that was awesome. And we've got about 10 minutes left for uh, questions from folks. So please do put those in to the Q and A. Ben, I was so glad to see you mention the Olympic Cougar Project. It's something we've been thinking about a lot and following closely. There's some really interesting and valuable research coming out of that project. Uh, right now, there are fires in the in the Olympic Olympic National Park, and you know I've been thinking about the mountain lions that are there, and and certainly it's an interesting topic to talk about how fires, wildfires, impact wildlife 
populations and how they impact mountain lions. Um, and, you know, it occurs to me that with wildlife crossings, those become, you know, emergency exits, right, as well when fires happen. Um, and so, you know, we talk about the value of wildlife crossings and so on, and, and, and certainly in the Olympic mountains, that idea of allowing um, immigration and emigration, the, those dispersing young mountain lions to, to travel back and forth is going to be critical for that population. Um, and with climate change, wildfires are going to be more, more, more common, right? And that's not just in the Olympics, but everywhere. Um, so anyway, that was just a thought that occurred to me. Um, I do have a question for you. When, when the topic of roads impacting wildlife comes up, as you mentioned, the place many people jump to is to think about roadkill. The animals that are struck by vehicles, it's something that, you know, any driver has seen for themselves and, and, and it's visible. In the first chapter, in the first chapter of your book, though, and, and today, you know, the roadkill is just the tip of the iceberg, right, in terms of the impacts that roads cause. And, and I'm, as you were starting to write this book, as you were as you were thinking about this, you know, was this world of road ecology a surprise to you? Um, and, you know, or, or 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 perhaps I should say, what aspects of what you learned were most surprising for you as you went through this? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, certainly you're you're right that roadkill is the tip of the iceberg. You know, I think I think that one of the striking things um, that I, I didn't expect to be a major focus of the book, but ultimately was, was the the, the impact of of noise pollution. You know, I think that we're so awash in road noise that we don't really notice it, and you know, and yet it's. It's you know it's elevating our blood pressures and stress stress hormones and making us more susceptible to heart disease and diabetes and stroke. You know road noise has this huge impact on our own lives. It's really a, you know I think one of the great public health crises of our time. And it's you know it's doing something very similar uh, to wild animals, right? It's it's hugely stressful. It's it is truly this form of habitat loss. And you know I think it's 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 a, a largely unaddressed problem. You know and there's I mean there's been you know, some, some fascinating research in California, uh, you know, showing that when you have a really noisy and bright as well, you know, light pollution is another issue. When you have a, a noisy, bright uh, highway, that actually makes it, that, that makes wild animals less likely to use wildlife crossings, right? Because the, you know, the, the animals don't want to approach a really bright, noisy highway. Um, so, you know, those sensory pollutants can, can be a, a huge challenge to, you know, successfully helping animals cross roads. And, you know, that's something that at Liberty Canyon, for example, you know, they're very consciously addressing, you know, building, including architectural elements like berms and vegetated screens into the design to, you know, blunt the noise and light pollution from the, you know, the busiest freeway in, in America, which is a, a huge, a huge task and challenge. So just to say that, you know, I think that those those sensory pollutants end up being a, a, a huge problem that uh, you know, a lot of people don't think about. Thank you for that. We had, we've had a couple of other questions come in in the Q&A, and, and this is your reminder to go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can in the next few minutes here. Um, Lori wrote in, and, and Lori is actually one of our new coexistence ambassadors. Uh, Lori wrote to uh, ask you to talk a little bit more about the movement to include road ecologists in future freeway construction projects. You mentioned the money, right? The uh, the funding that's available, but but talk about it in terms of and and you got into this in your book towards the end of your book. But if you could talk here a little bit about how um, road ecologists are becoming part of the conversation as road projects are planned. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a really a really good question. I mean, I think that that's you know, certainly, you know, look, I mean, one of the one of the, the the problems that we face is that, you know, when we, we we built the vast majority of our infrastructure without thinking about wildlife, you know, and and uh, and the you know, construction of the interstate highways preceded, uh, you know, NEPA and all of the, the laws that sort of force us to account for environmental impacts. And, you know, now um, that that is starting to change. But, you know, I do think that the, the problem is that, you know, most of the wildlife crossings get built and you know liberty canyon is certainly an exception to this um but most of the wildlife crossings that we build for example in ocelot country coincide with existing highway expansions and upgrades right a transportation department is going in there uh to you know add a couple of lanes or something like that and like you know as long as we've got the equipment out there let's add a wildlife crossing or two um which means that 
you know, I mean, certainly rhodochologists are involved in that that process, and those are good projects. But but I you know I think that often, again, we're you know we're we're putting wildlife crossings into places where the opportunity exists, not necessarily where the greatest areas of need are. Um, so you know, I'm I'm not exactly answering the question, um, but I, I guess to say that you know I think that we need you know that road ecology still needs to guide it needs to guide these projects more than it does again i think that we're you know we're building lots of crossings opportunistically when we're doing construction already um you know rather than um you know rather than building these kind of freestanding structures in places that we've identified as as being you know real collision hotspots or barriers to migration um so you know I, I, certainly road ecologists are, are much more part of the conversation now than they were you know even a decade ago um but you know i think we still have a long way to go um you know if if wildlife is truly going to be front and center and you know in, in our, our transportation decision making yeah thank you um so here's here's a, a another question for you that came in when these crossings go in, is there human misuse of those crossings? And if so, what does that look like? And 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 you know, how much of a problem is that? Yeah, it's a, it's definitely an issue. I mean, certainly, you know, humans do use you do use those those crossings. You know, I've I've uh, heard you know there's there's some famous crossings in Wyoming at Trappers Point for mostly for pronghorn and, and mule deer, and uh, you know those. Like the big sort of dirt berms on on top of these overpasses got used by you know ATVers and dirt bikers you know that that sort of thing uh, definitely definitely happens um, that that Snoqualmie Pass bridge um, that I, I showed a picture of there was um, I remember hearing a story about a group of um, the anti-vaxxers during COVID who wanted to hang a banner off of that that thing, uh, you know, sort of decrying decrying COVID vaccines. Um, so you know, people people do use these structures, and that that can definitely inhibit wildlife use. Obviously, animals you know animals fear humans and avoid them. Uh, and uh, you know, we, and it's uh, you know, I do think it's important that we keep people out of those structures, and you know, and and. Um, you know, I mean, certainly many of those projects, you know, they have they have fences that run uh, along alongside them. And, you know, and the fences are gated and the gates are, you know, generally locked. But, uh, you know, people certainly do get in there and, and um, you know, that can render a, a good wildlife crossing less effective. That's definitely a, an issue. Thank you. You know, a lot of folks tune in to, to something like this and a lot of folks who are, who are members of the Mountain Lion Foundation ask us, what can I do to help? And could you talk a little bit, you, you went into this in some detail in your book, could you talk just a little bit about some of the uh, community science efforts that you've seen in different places to help road ecologists get a handle on, um, you know, the, the impact that roads are having on wildlife and, and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, I think that's one of the great things about road ecology is that it's it's a science, it's a, it's a field that's ripe for public participation. You know, we're all driving out there, we're all seeing roadkill, and we're all potentially data collectors. You know, and there are lots of uh, lots of great apps that allow people to record uh, roadkill species and location and timing, uh, and that data can be really, really valuable, you know, especially for, for viewers who are in California, the California Roadkill Observation System, which is run out of UC Davis, is, you know, this fantastic app uh, that's recorded many thousands of, of roadkill sightings, uh, and some of that data has actually informed the location of wildlife crossings, you know, those, those participatory scientists, those volunteers, you know, you and me, uh, have identified these discrete roadkill hotspots and and uh, that's you know that's informed informed mitigation which is really cool so it is you know it's not like uh you know it's not like nuclear physics you know it is it is something that we can all participate in in, in some way thank you and for those folks who are listening i want to always remind them to uh visit our website because we've got signups there to stay engaged with mountain lion issues and and, and that's a way that people can help protect mountain lions as well. Ben, do you have a particular place that immediate com immediately comes to mind as, wow, you know, if I had the funding right now and a magic wand to putting in, put a crossing in place right now, where would it be? Mm, that's, a, that's a good, that's a really good question. 
Um, I mean, certainly, you know, I mentioned I mentioned East Vale Pass on I-70 in Colorado. I think that's, you know, that's that's one that comes to mind. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I just I, I just think about, you know, some of the some of the local sites and, you know, in in, uh, in Chafee County, where I where I live in, in kind of south central Colorado, you know, there are these we have a couple of underpasses, uh, you know, about 20 miles from us. But there are all of these all of these spots where, uh, you know, we, we see herds of elk approaching, uh, you know, Highway 285 and kind of bouncing off it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and certainly there are, you know, plenty of elk and mule deer and pronghorn uh, collision issues uh, in our, our community as well. And, and uh, yeah, so I can definitely think of a couple of a couple of spots uh, on Highway 285 near where I live that I'd, I would love to uh, address. And, you know, I mean, that's, again, kind of the beautiful thing about road ecology is that, you know, we're all observing these problems in our own communities and you know there are so many wonderful examples of, of wildlife crossings that were truly grassroots and bottom up and you know and, and led by people who identified an issue and you know in the place that they lived uh and uh you know that's it's a, again it's kind of a field or an issue that we can all participate in yeah well and i want to mention too you know you you started off your presentation by saying that Four million miles of roads are current currently exist in the United States, and that there are plans to build fifteen million more. And and if I'm if I'm remembering those statistics correctly, that means that there's an incredible opportunity for people to engage with their, uh, you know, their their representatives and leadership roles to to advocate for strong protections for wildlife as that new infrastructure gets built. Um, and that's exciting. I mean, that's the that's one of the messages of hope here, right? Which is that um, there are opportunities to do this right in a really big way moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you know, I mean, that that 15 million number, that's, you know, that's really, that's really worldwide, but it's, you know, but it's okay. certainly, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a global issue, you know, and um, I would imagine that, uh, you know, mountain lion lovers also care about all large wild cats and you know that all of those new that that new highway infrastructure targeted in places like Kenya and Nepal and Indonesia you know is going to have enormous impacts on uh, you know on all kinds of uh, wild wild felids um you know the asiatic cheetahs and you know another another species that's really on the the doorstep of extinction um you know thanks thanks and and significant part to uh, to roadkill you know roads have been identified as the primary threat to to tigers uh moving forward so it's you know it's it's truly this global issue um and you know mountain lions are uh, at the forefront along with uh, you know all other kind of large wild uh, wild felines all right last question and and this came in are have have you seen in your research things that have been effective in helping wildlife keep from getting killed on the along the sides of roads are are there things that are effective in getting drivers to decrease their speeds and be more aware of wildlife yeah you know it's, I, I was i was saying earlier that that signage doesn't really work right and that's certainly true of those you know those conventional yellow diamonds that you see everywhere those don't do anything um in part because drivers habituate to them right if you know if you see a, if you see a, a you know a panther crossing sign well if, I mean, you know you could drive you could drive past that sign every day for 10 years and never see a panther right and then you let your guard down and then one one dark night there's suddenly a panther you know so drivers habituate to these these signs and, and they're not effective as a result but you know what's more effective are responsive signs uh you know signs that actually have roadside radar and other sort of detection systems and, and can you know and can flash a you know, a real time warning saying, hey, there actually is a, you know, an animal on the road right now. Uh, and th that's much more effective in getting drivers to slow down and watch for wildlife than those static signs. So, you know, so those those are good at reducing roadkill rates, I guess, they, you know, but the, the the drawback with them, right, is that they don't necessarily do anything about that connectivity issue. Uh, you know, they, they might get drivers to slow down. But that doesn't necessarily get that doesn't necessarily help the animal cross the road, right? If there are you know a thousand cars driving along at forty miles an hour instead of sixty miles an hour, that avoids collisions, but it doesn't it doesn't uh, you know um, it doesn't reduce the barrier effect, right? So so even though those responsive signage systems can be helpful in reducing roadkill, you know I think that ultimately the best thing we can do is just give animals more opportunity to cross over and under the road rather than across its surface. And the way to do that is, is wildlife crossing structures. Well, thank you so much, Ben. And Ben, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen now. 
And I'm sure I'll, I'll and also, but I'll, I'll put, I'll pull up this sign super quick, Brand too, because I oh, yeah. mentioned this, this uh, upcoming talk. Thank you. That's terrific. Uh, we do have our, our next webinar in our series is with wildlife photographer Savannah Rose, as it says on the screen there. It's going to be on October 18th. And that's a reminder that our calendar is just about ready. It's actually at the printers right now. The Mountain Lion Foundation is one of the things we're famous for is our annual calendars. And so the 2024 calendar is soon to be hot off the presses. And I'd like to invite folks that are listening in to go ahead and make that annual donation or, or set up a monthly donation to the Mountain Lion Foundation. And folks that uh, give at $35 or more are going to get sent one of these calendars. And I've seen the photos that are in it and holy cow, it is a beautiful calendar. I, I, I hope I'm allowed to say that it's probably the best one ever. Um, but, but Ben, back to you. Thank you so much for this talk. I really appreciate the time that you took. You're in the middle of a book tour right now. So I appreciate that you set, set aside a little bit of time to talk to people who are really excited about mountain lions like we are. We did have one uh, question that came in in the, in the end that was talking about not just terrestrial wildlife crossing roads, but also aquatic wildlife crossing roads and, 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 and you know, culverts and so on. And this is a good time for me to, to mention your book again, because you actually go into that in some detail in your book. And so I wanna recommend that again. Um, it really was a wonderful book. Yes, thank you for the visual aid there. That's great. Um, so, uh, Thank you, Ben, and thank you to all of you who are listening in. This has been an awesome discussion. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we have one more book to give away, and I am pleased to report that Norman Bishop has won a copy of, of your book, Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. Hey, Norm, how's it going? I, 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 Norm, Norm's an, an amazing uh lifelong wolf biologist uh, who's very involved in the uh, the reintroduction of, uh, of wolves in Yellowstone. So he's a fantastic person to receive this book. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that uh, he's, he's the guy. <laughs> Wonderful. What a small world. That's cool. All right. Well, thank you. And, and thanks for tuning in, Norm. Um, I want to thank Lace Thornburg and Chelsea Robinson, who are behind the scenes with the Mountain Lion Foundation, helping make this go smoothly. Uh, with members in all 50 states and around the world, the Mountain Lion Foundation's work is funded by individual, individuals like you. And we're all folks who care about mountain lions. And please look at our website, mountainlion.org. You can join as a member there if you are not one already. You can also learn more about these amazing animals and find out how to be an advocate for mountain lions in your community. As I mentioned, we've got a calendar coming out soon. So hopefully that can prompt you to uh, go to our website and make a donation there. As Ben mentioned earlier, we've got our next webinar coming up on October 18th with one of the photographers featured in our 2024 calendar. Savannah Rose is a very talented wildlife photographer based in Wyoming. And it'll be another great talk. We hope to see you next month. Thank you very much with respect and appreciation. I am Brent Lyles with the Mountain Lion Foundation and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Ben. Thanks a lot, Brent. Appreciate it.